Aaron reminded me that I should let you know that both of us have been reappointed to this church for the next conference here. We were going to announce the names separately, but one of us might get cheered and one of us might get booed, so I didn't do it that way. Our epistle reading for this morning is from Philippians 1, 3 through 6. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Amen. The one who began a good work in us will bring it to conclusion. The one who leads us into holiness and righteousness speaks to us still. I chose those two scripture passages this, for this morning, 2 Corinthians and Philippians 1, because I think it talks to what I would like to talk about today. Now, I am no Apostle Paul. And God knows that I have not suffered for the faith as he did. But in every other respect, I can identify with Paul. I can identify with him as he writes to his most beloved congregation, Caesarea Philippi. Late, he's late in years at this point. And in those days, you got late in years much earlier than we do in our time today. Some of you have asked me, there's been a few of you that asked me this past week about this Sunday, and I, what they asked me, I got this a couple times, they said, is this your last sermon? <laughs> Sounds rather fatal like that, doesn't it? And I think where they were coming from was that this is the last Sunday of the month of May, the last day of the month of May. And in 30 days, we will have a new lead pastor. And then I might get scratched from the docket, so to speak. Well, there is a schedule out there, and I'm on the schedule at least one more time in June and in the fall, uh, so I guess it's all good. But I know that I shall preach other sermons from this pulpit. Uh, I've really not thought about that like that at all. But this is for us now a time of change and transition, and we know that, and we've been feeling it for the last several months, and that is always uncomfortable for folks, uh, for most of us. We don't like change. Uh, I don't like change. I like my routine. I like what I do when I do it and how I do it, and uh, people that are around me or those that have been very close to me know that. 30 days from now, we will have a new lead pastor. That phenomenon always seems to result in a new dynamic in the church, does it not? But this is really nothing new to Methodists. This is what we've experienced throughout the course of history in our denomination. We change up every now and then. Stop and think about it. You haven't changed. Aaron hasn't changed. I haven't changed. Aaron and I have even grown to like each other in the last four months. <laughs> Our building last changed 15 years ago, so it hasn't changed much. We need to make some changes, but we're, we're, we're getting there. It's all a process of moving forward this time, and it is all good. And I would ask you to remember that as we go through the process, the thing you need to remember most of all, is that God is in the mix. Change can come in many forms in our lives. It might come forcefully like a tidal wave. It might creep along incrementally like a glacier. It might come in the form of a devastating tragedy. 
might come along with difficult choices that have to be made, broken relationships that occur, or even new opportunities that just come along. I picture us kind of like this metaphor, like a giant jumbo jet that's sitting on a runway and it's loaded with people and all of a sudden you hear that shriek and you hear that whir of jet engines and you hear those engines ramping up and it's still sitting still and all of a sudden it starts down the runway and all of a sudden lifts itself up and just soars into the heavens. Even though change is often difficult, it can be for the best. Accomplishing anything great in life requires significant change that pushes us all out of our comfort zones. And many times the only way to improve our lives is to force ourselves to go about that change, to undergo that difficult change. And that might mean breaking up and leaving a stale but comfortable relationship leaving a mediocre but stale job, moving away from a nice but stale location, anything that is holding us back from accomplishing our dreams. We've had a wonderful run here for 14 years with Pastor Jack, and now Jack is, has gone and we have a new lead pastor coming. We will accomplish our dreams. But whatever change you're dealing with, the important thing is to know how you cope with it and how your attitude takes shape as you go through that change. And all of that will have an impact on our future and how we move forward with it. Actually, you and I are changing all the time, are we not? We change our clothes. We change our minds, we change our direction, we change and transition into new jobs. We change our cars, we buy a new car maybe every three, four, five, six years. We change our moods in an instant. And since change is part of our life, it is hard for us to grasp the truth, and this is what we need to remember, that God does not change. God does not change. Human beings have their good days and their bad days. But God never has a bad day, and God is in the mix. This characteristic of God is called God's immutability. immutability. Remember that God is at the core of all the activity under heaven, whether we partake in it or someone else does. All of the change through which we journey and that all of God's goodness and right purpose is in the mix. And in a world where consistency is a rare commodity, God is someone on whom we can depend. In a world where public opinion changes with the wind, God remains constant. And that should be our assurance and hope. One of the comments that we often hear is that one of the things people like about our church is the fact that even though our worship is pretty constant, we keep changing things. We do change things here. People like the fact that we add new studies, that we add new ministries, do something different at an event, or change worship patterns. We've done that. People tell us that change keeps things fresh. Aaron and I have worked together for the last four and a half months since mid-February, and we've done our best to move forward. The staff has done the same thing. The staff has rallied, and, and they've helped move the church forward. It's all a good thing. As Jack was stepping back a little because of his health declining, why we filled in where we needed to be, and we've just kept moving. If you can envision a flock of ducks or geese on the surface of a pond, on, on top of the still water, moving along, gliding, it's very peaceful and very serene, and there's an order to it. But underneath the surface of that water, they're paddling just as fast as they can. But it's good work, and it's all been good. Ralph Waldo Emerson once said, do not go where the path may lead, 
Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. And that's been the effort here. So it's all good. It's all moving forward. In this life, we, we always yearn for something that we can depend on. In a world of constant change and transition, it feels like we're, we're trying to hold on to a handful, a tight handful of sand, and it leaks out the sides, and it leaks out between our fingers. You have to move forward. But since God is immutable, we know that the really important things have not and will not change. And I think we need to be confident and take heart in that truth. I really do. God's evaluation of the human heart in all of this never changes. It's the same every generation. God's offer of salvation in Christ is constant. That's not going to change. The work of God's Spirit in a human heart is unaffected by the changes in society. The biblical definition of truth with a capital T remains a constant in spite of public opinion polls. Wherever we are in whatever circumstances we find ourselves, Jesus Christ, and this is biblical, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. God's word remains our standard of truth. That's not going to change. God's spirit remains as our guide. That's not going to change. And no matter where we are or what we are doing, the things that are truly foundational to our faith, the things we really must depend upon, have not changed at all. And that's at the core of what we do here. So we shouldn't fear transition and change. God does not change. God never changes. God's character never changes. God never is less than who God is. God never improves because there's no improvement possible. God is already perfect. God is always wise. God is always sovereign. God is always present. God is always good. God is always just. God is always holy. God is always merciful. God is always gracious. Whatever God is, God always is. It's not going to change. Not for us or anyone else. There are no sometimes attributes about God. All of God's attributes are always attributes. And what we need to remember, you and the two of us here, God is at the core of our existence. So therefore, change and transition are never done without God are never done alone or on our own. God is in the mix. God will always care. God will always seek a relationship with us. God will never give up on us. God will always forgive the one who truly repents, turns their behavior around. God will always save the one who rests in Christ's finished work. God will always defend, protect, and shield God's children. When he promises that everyone who comes to him will not be cast away, he means it, even though we know that we deserve otherwise. Those promises are true, regardless of what happens, change in the church. You see, we live forward, but we understand backward. Events that at the time that they happen seem so contingent, so accidental from our vantage point then, now seem to have involved a gracious hand at work. It's been true in my life, and I'll bet it's been true in yours. Of this I am confident, that he who started a good work in you will bring it to completion by the day of Christ Jesus. Now, we don't know how much time that is. That could happen an hour from now. It could happen 500 years from now. But it's the, precisely the memory of what God has already done for us in our individual lives and in our life as a church, His church, 
that arouses the hope and conviction that the future of this community of faith is in good hands, both in God's and in ours. Some time ago, I heard someone comment here in this church that God has already chosen someone to lead us. It is only for the district now to go out and find him or her. Well, the district has. And we all know, we will all know the feelings of melancholy at this time of transition. We had Jack's party and we wished him well. But then we will get on with it. We will get on with it as a community of faith. The future of this unique, embracing, inclusive, active family of faith. We have great momentum here. Great momentum here. We have a lot of things going right for us. We have a lot of things to offer. God's incredible gift to us for years to come. Whatever we do and wherever we do it. One of my favorite stories, a true story, concerns a woman, and this is rather timely, who taught vacation Bible school years ago in another city. And she had an experience that she will never forget. It was on a Tuesday, near the close of the class, and the class was interrupted when a new student was brought in. Little boy, preschool age, had one arm missing, and since the class was well underway, she had no opportunity to inquire about the problem, why one arm was missing, or the state of his adjustment, where he was with it. She was nervous, afraid that some of the other children would say a faux pas or say something that would comment on his handicap and embarrass him. And there was no way to caution him, there wasn't time, so she proceeded as carefully as she could to wind up the class and as the class time drew toward a close, she suddenly began to relax because nothing had happened. She asked the class to join her in their little closing ritual that they did every day. She said, let's make our churches. And we've all done this as children, haven't we? We've all done this. They each folded their hands and they began to recite, here is the church, here is the steeple, open the doors and here are all the people. And then she just stopped cold because she realized that what she had done was she had just compromised this little guy. He couldn't do this. And the very thing she had feared that the children would do, she had done. And as she stood there kind of speechless, suddenly a little girl sitting next to him reached over and put her left hand on his right hand, placed it within his and said, here, Davy, let's make church together. And they proceeded to finish the exercise. See, that's what we do here. That's what we do here. We make church together. Paul the Apostle summed it all up. And this is my prayer for all of you, that your love for one another may grow even richer in knowledge and insight of every kind, enabling you to learn by experience the things that really matter. God is in the mix. This is no time to fear. This is time to celebrate and go forward. New opportunities. Welcome to the faith we live today, which is our hope and future for all of our tomorrows. Thanks be to God. Amen.